previously on the American Justice Podcast. Now, we have already done a very extensive interview with you. I mean, I think it lasted two and a half, three hours or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know that we got lots of lots of information from you, okay? Um, but again, you, you contacted us and said that there was some other stuff that you wanted to tell us that you kind of thought was maybe strange or something. Yeah. That your brother was was doing, and and yeah. let me ask you: Do you suspect your brother? Yeah. There is an epidemic in America's criminal justice system: the prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to American Justice. The American Justice Podcast Army works to free men and women wronged by the criminal justice system. It's not only about the innocent who have been imprisoned, but also the victims of the crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now, here's your host, Scott Pogansey. Hello, AJ Army. Welcome back to your podcast. Last week, we finished up on the last of what I would consider the most important interviews in this case. Sure, there's lots of other interviews with Brandon's friends, his enemies, aka the shit kickers, etc. But these interviews provide pretty much all the information needed to arrest Brandon, and most of the information needed to convict him. After all, you can't have a known gay kid roaming the streets of small town Texas and let him get away with it. In today's episode, we will dive into the findings of body language expert Susan Constantine. I have to put out there a disclaimer. Today, we'll be discussing whether or not Michael Etherington, Charla Woodruff, or Brandon Woodruff are displaying tone and body language that shows deception. We have to make it abundantly clear that we, Susan included, are not accusing anyone of lying. In fact, we're not accusing anyone of anything. The only thing we're doing is relying on an expert in the field of body language and detecting deception to give us her best analysis of these interviews. No one can tell 100% whether or not someone is lying. Normally, we would leave that up to the detectives. But what we can tell you is that a person that is being deceptive would display these types of characteristics and whether or not these subjects are displaying them. The only time that we can tell if someone is straight up lying is if we can prove the words that they're using are false. And I think we've covered these interviews enough to know which stories we can prove are false. Like, 99% probably. <laughs> now, if by chance the name Susan Constantine rings a bell, it's probably because she has interpreted the body language of several high-profile cases over the years. If you're into true crime television on pretty much any major network, chances are you've seen or heard her before. If you're clueless on the name, let me give you some background on Susan. She is a body language expert and specializes in detecting deception through nonverbal clues, a human lie detector, if you will. When it comes to monitoring the body language of people during criminal investigation interviews, she's the one that you want on the stand. She has a master's degree in psychology and multiple certifications in investigating, interrogative interviewing, cognitive interviewing, and analytic interviewing. She's helped attorneys select and deselect jurors in major cases, as well as report on nonverbal deception of people squirming in a courtroom. She's had over 1,000 national appearances. She trains investigators and officers in the ways of proper investigation. For the record, she did not train Ranger Collins. Now let me ask you this. Do the names Casey Anthony, George Zimmerman, Pistorius, Jody Arias, Lance Armstrong, or maybe Dr. Cornod Murray ring a bell? You guessed it. 
She's been involved with all of these cases. For the totally uninformed, Dr. Murray was Michael Jackson's doctor that prescribed him the ill-fated propofol for a sleep aid. For the record, he should not have done that. Rest in peace, Michael. Rest in peace. Susan Constantine was in the courtroom in several of these cases as part of the media, detecting deception in defendants, jurors, and witnesses. Yeah, she's kind of a big deal. Now, wouldn't it be nice if someone with those abilities and credentials could analyze the Brandon Woodruff case? Wouldn't it just be absolutely amazing if Susan Constantine could view interviews with Brandon, Charla, and Michael Etherington to see who gives clues of deception? Well, your wish has been granted on today's episode of the American Justice Podcast, because she has done exactly that. This expert human lie detector was given the video interview footage and picked it apart like a champ. Unfortunately, this interview with Susan Constantine was conducted after Brandon was convicted and incarcerated, so it has no bearing on his case. All it can basically do at this point is reveal who is telling the truth, who is lying, and that taxpayer money was wasted on the investigative talents of a particular Texas Ranger. Let's begin with Brandon's interview because I'm pretty sure that's what is on everybody's mind. I mean, yes, we can talk about whether or not Charla or Mike are lying, but at the crux of this case and this podcast is whether or not Brandon is lying. I mean, after all, they could all three be lying. Who knows? So let's see what Susan thinks of Brandon's body language. Right away, before any words have been spoken, Susan notices what is happening in the room's physical space. Brandon is 19 years old and, other than the fight at school with the Hagerman shit kicker, has never been in any type of legal trouble. Susan says that she can just imagine the amount of anxiousness and nervousness Brandon is feeling in the unfamiliar, scary environment. Also, Brandon is seated in a corner, immediately creating a sense of isolation and more anxiety. She claims that the rules against this are taught in Investigative 101. If you've been listening since the first episode, this misstep should not come as any surprise to you at this point. An investigator should always initially build rapport, and a safe environment for the suspect. Both of these go right out the window. Hell, the introductions aren't even swapped until the seven-minute mark of the interview. Investigators know it's Investigative 101 is build rapport. Building rapport and creating a safe environment, someone where a person feels comfortable in that environment is crucial to the outcome of any investigation. In the first seven minutes of when I analyzed the tape with Brandon, the rapport building stage was less than adequate. And that's the first time after seven minutes that he actually introduced his name. That should have come right in, out of the gate. Hi, I'm, you know, and introduce themselves and introduce everyone in the room. And then during that rapport building skills, you want to ask questions where you don't increase the anxiety. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Is there anything I can get for you? You know, the, the restroom is around the corner. Anytime you want to stop, we can stop. And then, you know, we can take breaks and know that in any time that we can stop this interview because you're not under, under arrest. The first thing that Susan does for us, and I can't thank her enough for this, is she explains how she comes to the conclusions that she does. I mean, anyone can come in here and say he's lying there or she's being deceptive there, but Susan really takes the time to explain to us the research behind how she's been trained how she instructs the police and investigators that she trains, and how she comes to the conclusions that she does. I have to admit, 
I was pretty much hanging on every word while I was interviewing her, and even sometimes had to catch myself to get back in the mode of interviewer instead of admiring student. All right, so she begins explaining how she judges facial expressions, words being said, movement, and tone of voice. She builds a baseline for Brandon's nonverbal communication. In a nutshell, his body language. A way to differentiate between his normal behavior and when he's under stress. The investigators wouldn't even let Brandon finish a story without interruption. Two big bad badges and one kid. Carry on, gentlemen. With all the high-profile cases Susan Constantine has witnessed over the years, she found this particular interview difficult to watch, cringeworthy. The next thing she looks for is what she refers to as pockets and clusters to give indicators of deceptive demeanor. Here she is explaining what that means. Next thing that we look for are what we call pockets or clusters of gestures that would give indicators of deceptive demeanor. That's why you have to have a baseline so you understand the person's normal behavior. That way we know that when we can see clusters of shifts or movements that are different from the normal behavior, we now know that those are what we call hot spots. Hot spots are what we call clusters, meaning that an investigator will ask a question that may create anxiety. Did you kill your mother and father? And stop there. We're looking at Brandon then to notice if there were multiple things that happened. Did he shift in his chair? Did he lick his lips? Did he tap his fingers? Did he roll his eyes? Did he shoulder shrug? We're looking for three indicators, minimum of three indicators within a five second period of time when a stimulus question is given. That's the rule to detecting deception. Oftentimes we see body language experts or even professional investigators that they note that maybe somebody scratched their face or they licked their eyes or they looked up to the right or they looked up to the left and there are just single indicators and, and and they are already assessing that the person is being deceptive. That is a very amateur way of detecting deception and it's inaccurate. The research says, if you read the most current FBI bulletin, is that we are looking for clusters, things that are different from the norm and they happen in a very quick moment. The other thing is, is that gestures are unique to individuals. So for example, if someone's shoulder shrugs, licks their lips and rolls their eyes, that might be an indicator that that person's uh, being deceptive or another person might stammer, fidget their fingers and lick their lips. There are no such thing, there is no such thing of three uh, slam dunk movements that are deceptive. Now, let's discuss Brandon's interview itself. I could go on literally for hours talking about how inexperienced and amateurish she believed these investigators were, but I'm really trying to keep this down to one episode. If you want to hear more about Susan's opinion of the interview tactics and investigators themselves, you'll just have to check out the documentary for more footage of her interview. We'll cover a lot more about this in the documentary. There's not a whole lot to talk about here because... I hate to break it to you, but Susan doesn't find any deception in Brandon's interview. However, she does notice that Ranger Collins asks Brandon multiple questions at once rather than letting him answer one single open-ended question. She believes this tactic is used to lead Brandon down a predetermined pathway. The suspect should be allowed to tell the story from beginning to end. So when the time comes for an inevitable recap, the investigator can make note of any alterations in his story. Times, places, and people involved. If the suspect sways slightly in the details, it's because they're human. No one can remember every single detail of any given situation. 
a liar would have their story memorized and concrete, kind of like a pre-rehearsed story. Remember Mike Etherington wondering to himself aloud where he was in his, quote, story? To put a phrase to it most would recognize, these investigators are, quote, leading the witness. It wouldn't be allowed in a court of law, and it should never have been allowed during this interview phase of Brandon Woodruff. In her words, the investigators were inexperienced and had no real plan. In addition, and to explain away suspicion from some previous episodes, she also says that no two people who have experienced trauma react to it in the same way. This sweeps away Michelle Lee's and certain family members' attitude towards Brandon's behavior at his parents' funeral. On top of that, Brandon's calm demeanor during the interview is not a sign of deception either. It's consistent throughout. Unlike the behavior shown in other people's interviews, nudge, nudge, hint, hint, wink, wink. Okay, I'm sure you know what I mean. Spoiler time! Susan Constantine, with a high level of accuracy, I might add, found nothing of significance revealing deception in Brandon's interview. He's telling the truth. He's in a room with two investigators and two so-called attorneys. He's pushed into a corner, and he shows no anxious signs of deception. Well, I exaggerated a little. He did shift just one time, when they asked him about his height. (laughs) Not sure what his reason for deception might be concerning his height, but it has no bearing on the case. We'll let Brandon have that one. He's acting guarded and clearly uncomfortable, scared even, from being locked in a tiny interview room with big bad investigators with guns on their hips. But he's not lying. He even refers to his parents in the present tense as though, still, in his mind, they're still alive and waiting for him to come home in Roy City. His statement about having a good relationship with and loving his sister is told in truth as well. So, who is lying about that relationship? Don't worry, we'll get there soon enough. Susan continues that a liar, even a trained sociopath, has to control both their speech and their demeanor in order to be deceptive. They can't successfully do both at the same time. No human can. No matter how carefully concocted their story is or the articulation of their words, their body will always tell the truth. Deception triggers anxiety. Knowing the truth and attempting to formulate the untruth, Susan even goes on to say that people who begin sentences with the phrases honestly and to tell you the truth or I swear to God are more than likely being deceptive. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That sentence of knowledge alone is what you should all take out of this podcast and apply to your daily lives. If any of you need a good divorce attorney after that little truth nugget, leave me a comment. I'll be happy to get you that information. So here's Susan describing what I just talked about and applying it to Brandon's interview as a whole. Enjoy. Um, you know, what questions are asking, he's, he's in a corner, now keep that in mind, he's in a corner, he's got four people around him, he's in a room, an environment he's never been in before. That in itself will create anxiety. But throughout the video, I didn't see any major shifts that were associated with, with a deceptive um, indicators. For example, I didn't know that there was any questions that were asked that created any sort of physiological response that I said, right here's a hot spot, here's where I want to focus, and let me go back through there and really review second by second movements and tie it to content. Because what I'm doing is I'm tying what he's saying to what he's not saying. Are the gestures congruent? For example, people talk with their hands. They may move hands, say, well, this is what I did one day, and this is what I did another day, and your hands would show difference in time. Now, many times he was asked questions, yes or no questions, and he would answer either yes or no. And what I was looking for is any incongruencies between 
him answering a question, for example, did you kill your parents? And he would have said, if he were deceptive, he would have said, no, I would never have done that. But rather, he's saying, that's crazy. And, and when you go, that's crazy, that is like a, a gesture that's saying, the processing is like, are you kidding me? And that, that shaking, that rapid shaking back and forth is, is processing, mind processing of information that's almost incomprehensible. Let's all remember that Susan is not just looking at Brandon, Mike, and Charla, though. She's also looking at Ranger Collins' body behavior as well. She describes him as someone who doesn't know where to go in the investigation. He's powerless and confused as to what pathway to take next. His neck is invisible like a turtle. Yes, a turtle. She describes this as natural human behavior as well as something found in reptiles and birds and other animals. Body language is everything when communicating with creatures who lack the ability to speak. In Ranger Collins's case, he truly doesn't. Nothing is working. As we all know at this point, he's improvised. Intense pressure during the investigation process, in Susan's opinion, has caused many innocent people to spend the rest of their natural lives in jail. Brandon is being bullied into a conviction by a professional bully behind a badge. All right, so as I described earlier, there's really not a lot more to tell about Brandon's interview. He didn't give any clusters of deception. He didn't cause any concern as far as the body language, etc. Basically, her conclusion is that, in her expert opinion, Brandon was telling the truth. I don't mean to give spoilers for the episodes about the appeals at the end of this season, but let's just say the polygraph tests that Brandon took agree with Susan. All right. Let's move on to Mike's interview. There's quite a bit of difference between Brandon's interview and Mike's interview. With Brandon, there were four intimidating people in the room. With Mike, just two. The investigators are even dressed in a more relaxed manner. I guess, since Brandon was already incarcerated, they could take off their powerful uniforms and replace them with their casual investigation clothes. They allow Mike Etherington free reign over the conversation as he spills his guts from beginning to end regarding his relationship with Brandon. They don't constantly interrupt him like they did with Brandon. They just sit there and listen. They listen forever. Just like we did at the American Justice Podcast. We listened and listened and listened to a narcissistic, jealous rant that lasted from junior high school until after graduation. We'll get over it, though. Perhaps one of the subjects in question knows the number to a good therapist. <laughs> oh, never mind. I don't suffer from insanity. I enjoy every minute of it. All right. As we know by now, Mike walked into the interview with a well-rehearsed, guts-spilling agenda. God, that was hard for me to say. I think sometimes C. Derek puts similar consonant sounds together on purpose just to see if I can say them. Well, take that, C. Derek. I did it. Okay, so Susan, the seasoned, educated, and proper investigator she is, could not believe the Texas Rangers ran with Mike's third-party information provided in the arrest affidavit. Still, just to put a point in Ranger Collins' score column, she does describe him as possessing integrity due to his behavior once he found out about Mike dropping the ball with the MySpace information. At one point during the message, or during the interview, what, that uh, Mike gave some inaccuracies. Uh, what I did like what the investigator did is that he, he was pretty upset because the information was incorrect. And then the most remarkable part about all these interviews was that this investigator made decisions based on third party information. Who in their right mind makes a decision to arrest somebody based on third party information? 
In fact, in the court of law, that's hearsay. So unless that investigator went back and backed that up to find out whether that was true or not, uh, he did Brandon an entire dis uh, disservice. In fact, he realizes the capacity of what just occurred because he had a hard time con uh, c uh, controlling himself. He was furious because he said, I made a decision and it affected Brandon's liberty. And that was huge. So it shows that the investigator has integrity. They says, you know, we shouldn't disrupt it. His, you, you could tell that he knew that he did something he shouldn't have done based on that third party information. Just as a side note here, at the American Justice Podcast, we agree with Susan. We have never said and never will say that Ranger Collins was being nefarious or unscrupulous in his investigation. In fact, with everything that I have reviewed about this case, with the one exception of Brandon's phone records, there is no indication that Ranger Collins was acting in any other role than an honest investigator. I completely believe that he truly believed Brandon was guilty. I do also believe that he was biased and impervious to exculpatory information about Brandon, but I don't believe that he was trying to arrest a man that he thought was innocent. However, as we've discussed thoroughly in this podcast, having those blinders on and automatically assuming someone is guilty can definitely sway your investigation. And sometimes that bias can end up incarcerating an innocent person as is what happened here. Okay, back to Mike's interview. She interprets Mike Etherington's conveyance as one belonging to a person who admires Brandon, someone highly jealous of the person he was and his lifestyle. Pure resentment that more than likely began early and developed to a deep level over time. His tone of voice completely changes any time he describes Brandon. Anytime Mike speaks of himself, it's done in a positive manner. When he talks about Brandon, pure fire and brimstone. Here's where I found things that were concerning. You will note that when he describes Brandon, he changes his tone of his voice. For example, when he talks about Brandon and I did this or did that, and then he said, and Brandon replied back with, well, he changes his tone. So he speaks in a tonality, like uh, playing the part of Brandon by taking on a different tone, a different attitude. And he did that subconsciously. So when he talked about himself, he painted himself in a positive light, Mike did, but when he painted uh, Brandon in a negative light his tonality changed so Mike elevated himself which was a form of satisfaction like Brandon is not the greatest guy you ever saw he's not the most perfect guy so let me tell you of all the things that he did that were bad when he receives a phone call in the absence of the investigators he sprawls out in comfort during the conversation with his fellow shit kicker underling, Joe Hageman, he's constantly defending his own actions as though the person on the phone doesn't totally agree with what he's currently doing. He's gained a noticeable amount of confidence when the investigators left the room because he kicks his feet up as though he owns the place. The big man on campus, so to speak. One thing also I found really interesting was when the investigators left the room, you may have noticed that Mike kind of sprawled out, kicked his legs right out, made a phone call. Why? Because he's got a report. He's got, he's the gossip. Let me just call up somebody and let me tell them what's going on in here. And whoever he was speaking to on the phone obviously didn't think that what he was doing what was right because then he tried to defend himself. You could see his tone and his words changed and he felt very confident. He's kicking his legs out. He's thinking, yeah, I'm the big man on campus in here. They just wanted those information. You know what? I'm feeding self right now. 
this is really good for me. I'm feeling very powerful right now. So in my professional opinion, anything that Mike says, I would not find is that he is a credible witness. I would have removed him off my list as being a credible uh, witness because he had an agenda, he had a motive, and there was not a speckling throughout the conversations of the things they did do that was fun and things that they are good things or and they were all like let me line them all up and literally took the shotgun and just threw bullet holes through them to tell the investigators and to taint Brandon as a, a horrible person. His body language describes someone who is highly interested in what's going on, willing to engage, and do anything within his power to push his agenda. He leans back into a defensive position when the questions are being asked, but leans towards the investigators when speaking to advertise what he's selling. Bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. He's selling bullshit. She proclaims that his insistence to interrupt and speak over the voice of anyone else speaking is a sign of immaturity. He speaks as though everything is pure truth just because it comes out of his mouth even though it came from a third, or in his case, fourth party. He comes up with rehearsed, quick answers before the entire question is even asked. With Brandon now out of the way, he's in the spotlight in his circle of friends for the very first time. He even refers to Brandon as, quote, the kid, to de-escalate his stature within their group. His big MySpace confession, even though he claims it came from third-party information, is a flat-out lie according to the expert. Major deception throughout the interview, and not only with the investigators, but with whoever is on the other end of that phone conversation during the interview break. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all of the interactions with Ranger Collins when he found out the MySpace was bullshit, because even Mike admits it's BS at least as far as seeing it himself. But let's just suffice it to say that Susan didn't have a lot of nice things to say about Mike during this part of the interview. Okay, so now it's Charla's turn. Immediately, Susan hones in on something that I think anyone that watched the interviews knew. Charla's all over the place. Body anchor shifts, rapid hand movements, the crossing and uncrossing of her legs, her behavior clusters are pinging throughout the interview with cluster gestures and deceptive hints. Susan refers to some of Charla's explanations as delusional thinking and that she's living in her own altered reality resembling the behavior of someone having a psychotic breakdown. Again, she's amazed by how the investigators don't come back to any of Charla's information for an explanation especially when she mentions Mike Etherington. A real investigator would want to know why this particular person received a name drop over anyone else potentially involved in the case. Thinking back, Mike also mentions Charla a time or two during his interview with Ranger Collins without the investigators even leading him down her direction. Could it be that the two of them were heavy on each other's minds at the time for one reason or another. If not for the sake of the crime itself, but just to make sure that each other's interviews were on the same page. One can only speculate at this point because our dutiful investigator never questions it or finds it to be odd. No questions asked. So I'm not going to go through Charla's interviews piece by piece, but I'm just going to play a couple of interesting clips from Susan talking about the interviews and what kind of witness she thought that Charla would make. Okay, in this particular segment, during the interview, the question was asked, you know, are you mama's girl or a daddy's girl? And at that moment, you see that little movement of shimming around a little bit and then the giggle underneath the breath and said, I play them both. That just, the word played is a manipulative technique. So there were many words that she could have selected. The answer would have been, 
I'm both a mom and a dad's girl, but she didn't say that. She said, I played them both, meaning that she manipulated them and played up to one and she played up to the other one to get what she wanted with that parent at the time that she wanted it. And that's manipulative. And uh, so there was both mutual, but in her opinion, she's saying, well, I may have been a volatile, but I only did it because, you know, so that's kind of like that excuse for it. But then she shifts her body language, right? So that's when she kind of crosses her arms, puts her hands into her pockets. So that's showing concealment. When you conceal information, you generally will hide your hands, uh, but there was a, a definite attempt to doing that. I mean, it doesn't appear that it's cold in there that she would do that and want to gain cover to feel warmth. But she did a couple things. That's what those cluster gestures are that we talked about. Shifted her body language, crisscrossed her, arm, her legs the other way, and then put her hands to a pocket. That's a cluster gesture. It means she's concealing information. She says that he did all the horse whip thing, but doesn't put her into it, the event. In other words, there is an action. If you don't put yourself into the action, it's deceptive. A liar never puts themselves into the event. So they will say, I, 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 and then when the event happens, they don't put themselves into it. There was, it would, the truthful statement would have been, and then that's when he hit me with a horse whip, or that's when he did, hit me and did the horse whip thing. The fact that she didn't put herself into the event was intentionally omitted for a purpose, to serve her own purpose. I mean, I'm just telling you, statement analysis, that's, that's that standard. They always put themselves into the event in a truthful statement. They omit it when they don't, when they don't want to put themselves into the event. The subconscious mind cannot put them into the event when it didn't happen. It's that simple. <laughs> what is interesting is that then Mike's name is mentioned. So I don't see anyone, then the next question is, yeah, I think your aunt mentioned that name too. And she says, all right, he didn't go back and ask more questions. Why would you have thought, why did you men mention Mike? See, there's these, all these missing pieces where these investigators didn't follow through on all these aspects. There was so much information here that they're missing out on. And if they would have just used some more investigative tools and repeated that person's name and said it with a tone question mark, Mike, you know, Ather Etherington, that would l tell the person who is giving that information to give me more information why you said that. And I see that throughout these transcripts. It's like there's so much stuff that just kind of gets rolled over. And if this is what you're using in your investigation, which is what's building your case, wow. You know, there's a ton of stuff that could have been pulled out of here if they were thinking more on their feet. They just, I'm astounded that there's, this stuff has not been followed through. It's astounding to me. You know, there, there really is, some I hate to say it as this is poor investigative work. <laughs> you can say that again, Susan. Okay. So I've presented to you Susan's analysis of all three people's interviews with the investigative team looking into the deaths of Dennis and Norma Woodruff. Last week, I asked you to decide for yourself whether or not you thought Charla, Mike, or Brandon were telling the truth. Did you agree with Susan? Let me know in the comments. Okay, I'll let Susan sum up her work on these interviews and then I'll have a final word. I've reviewed the transcripts and the videos of Charla, Brandon, and Mike. Here's my conclusion. After reviewing Brandon's tape, there are no significant indicators that would determine that Brandon was deceptive. There are no clusters, which I call three gestures in one within a five second period that gave me um, information, enough information to, to conclude that Brandon was being deceptive. On the other hand, when I look at Mike's interview and transcript, there is a lot of stuff that's going on there. Mike is very jealous of Brandon. 
Mike is also a person that likes to gossip. He wants to be the big man, the big showboat. You know, he saw Brandon bigger than life. Mike would like to have been there and he was jealous of him. There were multiple indicators and where he was being deceptive. He also, th he, when he's speaking, he speaks as if it's truth from him, but it's a collaboration of third party information. And that is, in my opinion, hearsay. And it would never hold up in a court of law. And there's no, now I understand why the state never used him as a witness because he would impeach himself. It was very clear just watching his body language that he was all over the place. He gave multiple clusters of gestures of deceptive uh, indicators. Charla, on the other hand, are also, there are also many different indicators of being deceptive. The whipping. She's trying to describe and adding lots of emphasis that he was very, very violent, that he whipped her with um, a horse whip, but yet she never uses any action when she says it. There's no change in her voice inflection. It really did not make sense because the words and the body language did not match. Other things that she said, she would give you information about a Ku Klux Klan or you know a, a girl or a, a girl dude. These phrases that she picked up out of the air is either she's having a psychotic breakdown or we have to really examine why she used them and the investigators didn't ask the follow-up questions why she used the word girl uh, home girl or the other one was a dude or home dude and the other one was the Ku Klux Klan you know investigator 101 you want to come back and ask why would you say home girl Homegirl is, is, is a particular, very particular phrase. So we want to know what she really meant by that. But she was actually giving you reason why there was other events that she didn't put herself into it. So I just want to give you a little bit of information about uh, deception. When a person uses I, me, or my, they're putting themselves into the event. When something really uh, is, when something is deceptive, they omit their name in there or I. They omit themselves in the event the, the particular reason why. It's because they can't put them into the event because it would be, it would bring attention to themselves and they can't do that when they're being deceptive. So there's lots of different areas within all of them that there's a lot more to the story than what's really being told and I believe there's more people involved than if Brandon so-called did it and out of the three that Brandon, in my opinion, and based on my expertise, with a high level of certainty, that Brandon is innocent. There you have it, my American Justice Army. Susan Constantine's analysis of the Brandon Woodruff case. Susan is amazing, and having her analysis of these subjects has just been invaluable. I can see now why the media hires her to do the work that she's so good at. I can also see why law enforcement agencies hire her to train their investigators. I'm sure that each and every police detective that goes through her training is better for it. I don't think we need to have a patent pending Scott Pogancy personal opinion this week because honestly, I've talked about all three of these interviews extensively. However, all I will say is that after listening to and learning from Susan so much during those few hours I was with her, it became abundantly clear that the investigators in this case were amateurish and did not seem to have any kind of investigative path other than proving their number one suspect was guilty. So many times over and over I can say to myself, if they would have just done this or looked at that, things would be different. We can only hope that Ranger Collins learned from this and applied better investigative techniques in subsequent investigations. But who knows if that's true or not. Okay, in the next episode, we will cover Joe Hageman's and Dustin Perry's interviews. 
you're going to hear from someone that knew Joe very, very well. You're going to see a side of him that you won't want to miss. We haven't really talked about Joe that much as of yet, because from what I've been able to assess, Mike seems to be the puppet master. Next week, you'll see that Joe was the muscle. Joe also has a lot of demons he doesn't want escaping his closet of secrets either. But again, if you're going to understand the whole story, the whole Brandon Woodruff case, you must understand Joe Hageman as well. Here's a small preview of what's to come next week. Just a quick note about this clip. You'll probably notice that I am disguising this person's voice. The reason for this is that they only agreed to meet with me and tell me all about Joe under the condition of complete and utter anonymity. You'll hear a lot from this person next week. And trust me, you will not want to miss anything of what they have to say. Until then, stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. See you then. Joe and I went to kind of an after party. Not sure why Joe decided he needed to tell me about a murder. Joe told me that his friend's parents were murdered. I blew it off. I was like, okay, well. So I, of course, asked, well, who did it? Like, what happened? Like, Joe said, well, it was some kids at school that they think did it.